Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Fabiana Bacchini. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. And every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm hosting Facebook Live, bringing experts, researchers, parents from all over Canada, and sometimes from all over the world to share their expertise, their experiences, and what they are working on at this moment. A lot of uh, education sessions have been canceled in hospitals across the country since the pandemic started. So we've been bringing those uh, live sessions, which can, uh, which are also recorded and available on our website. Then you can watch at any time and you can access all the past sessions on our uh, website, which is canadianpremies.org. And you know, from October 26th to October 30th, I'm gonna be hosting the Premi Health Talks, which will be a series of Facebook Live, bringing experts and parents to talk about the premature lungs, RSV, COVID-19, and the parental experiences in the NICU during this time of the pandemic. So stay tuned and registration is already open and it's free. And you can also go to our website for that. And today I'm very excited because I have a topic here uh, that is re very relevant for parents anywhere. We're gonna talk about child behavior and you're gonna talk specifically about this one therapy, applied behavior analysis as known as ABA. And a lot of us know ABA for kids uh, on the spectrum of autism, but there's so many more applications for that. And to discuss, I invited here Leslie Barrera, which is a board certified behavior analyst who has worked in the fields of children's mental health, neonatal follow-up and intellectual disabilities across the lifespan. Leslie currently works at Surrey Place in Toronto. She's actively involved in promoting the science of behavior analysis in Ontario. She has served as an elected director at large for the Ontario Association for Behavior Analysis. Her clinical interests include parental mediated interventions, goal setting self-management and infusing, uh, acceptance and commitment training, as known as ACT, into traditional functional behavior assessment and intervention. Leslie, thank you so much for joining us here today. What a pleasure to be chatting with you this afternoon. Thank you, Fabiana. It's always nice to see you. So I will um, let you start your presentation to talk about ABA and also ACT, and then you have uh, time for Q&A at the end. And if you do have questions, please send on the comments below. And we're also going to be sharing the links that uh, Les is going to be talking about during the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. OK, so I'll just share my screen here. There we go. Okay, so applied behavior analysis, something I, I do love to talk about, it's close to my heart, uh, and I've built a career in it. So the field of applied behavior analysis, or ABA, is a technology based on the science of behavior. And as a science, its ultimate goals are to understand and improve human behavior. So what do we really want to do in ABA, that applied question, is, is really we want to address meaningful human problems. So in, in my world, that usually means working with parents, teachers, or caregivers to, uh, to address problem behaviors, whatever that might be. And then uh, the subject matter, what are we studying? Well, we define behavior as anything that we can say or do. So it has to be observable or at least reportable in order to quantify and predict it. And in addition to observing and predicting behavior, the highest level of understanding, just like in any other science, is control. And I'm not talking about mind control. I'm referring to the ability to demonstrate functional relationships between behavior and variables in the environment. And all that basically means is we're looking to the context, the environment, both physical and social, for causes of behavior. So ABA is a relatively small field, but it's established and still growing. There's over 40,000 board certified behavior analysts worldwide. That's according to the, the BACB, our certifying body. And uh, we have a few professional associations. I've just put their uh, logos up on the screen there. And we've got peer reviewed scientific journals. These are two of our, our flagship journals, but there's more. And as uh, Fabiana mentioned, Chances are, if you've heard of ABA, it was probably in the context of 
intervention for young kids with autism. And if you're living in Ontario, then you likely saw a lot of headlines last year about proposed changes to the Ontario Autism Program. So, and that's ongoing. Um, there's, there's a lot of great behavior analytic research and clinical work in autism across the lifespan, actually. But these, these principles have very broad application and you can take this lens, this way of looking at, at the world and apply it to just about any human problem like uh, workplace performance or climate change and, and even racism. So if anything really, this lens is about trying to understand why we do what we do. To find out more information about the field, uh, you can check out any of these websites. Uh, I, would, I would definitely direct you to the ONTABA website. That's our local professional association and they've very recently come out with some resources for the public about what ABA is all about. And on the, the main page, if you click on the resources tab and then go to reports, you'll find a lot of great resources. And they've recently published a, a white paper about behavior analysis in schools. Currently, the practice of ABA is unregulated in Ontario, but that's gonna be changing soon, which is great news. All right, so I'm gonna give you uh, in the next six minutes, uh, a boiled down master's course in behavior analysis. This is basically ground zero of the behavior analytic view. We call it the three term contingency. And you can pretty much look at anything you did today and break it down into this sequence if that's useful. So the A that stands for antecedent and that's basically whatever happened directly before the behavior and that's within the order of seconds. So that could be the green light that appeared before you pressed the gas pedal to proceed through the intersection, or it could be being told no before you drop to the floor and had a tantrum. Um, the B is obviously behavior. And again, we define that as anything we can say or do. Sometimes it's a problem behavior, like a tantrum or self-injury or not listening, or sometimes it's a skill that we're trying to teach, whether it's uh, learning to um, fall asleep on your own or uh, not in your parents' bed or uh, brushing your teeth, toilet training, any, any skill that you're trying to teach somebody, we could plug that in here. And then the consequence, that's essentially the effect that that behavior or skill had on the environment. So what happened, again, in the order of seconds. In behavior analysis, we're really interested in the consequences of behavior because it's those outcomes that drive whether or not that behavior is likely to happen again in the future under similar circumstances if it served a function. So people often think antecedents cause behavior and, and that happens with reflexes. So for example, if a barky little dog bit your hand, that happened to me in Portugal a couple of summers ago, you will, well, what I did is I withdrew my hand. Nobody had to teach me that, that's, that's a reflex. So, so that happens, but for, for learned behaviors, the antecedents can serve as cues or motivation, but causation is in the consequence. So consequences determine future behavior. And I'm gonna give you a, an everyday example. All right, just say the phone rings and the behavior is, you pick it up and say hello. Turns out it's your dear friend and you have a lovely conversation and you chat and you laugh and it's wonderful, very reinforcing. So that's great. Second scenario, phone rings again, but this time on the call display, you see that it's your mother-in-law. Now, do you reflexively pick up the phone? Uh, no, you probably hit the decline button. And what's the consequence of that? Well, you avoid receiving that helpful advice. Somehow, curiously, equally as reinforcing as chatting with your friend. So uh, no offense to any mother-in-laws out there, but I hope you can catch the idea from this. So in behavior analysis, we talk a lot about the function of behavior. And uh, there's, there's a little nerd joke in the field where we say WTF, what's the function? And that's really the question we're trying to get at when uh, somebody's engaging in some problem behavior and we don't know why it's happening. We need to figure out the function. So the things to know about function is that if a behavior is happening at the same rate or more over time, something is reinforcing it. It's serving some function for that individual. And that could be a pro-social behavior. It's getting reinforced and they're doing it again and again. Or it could be a behavior that is 
not appropriate, one that we don't really want to see or is not appropriate for that context. What's the purpose that that behavior serves? Well, if you pretend that you're a video camera and you just watch that individual engage in a behavior, what you're looking for is what happened directly after. Was something added? Was something taken away? Uh, what did that behavior end up doing? What was the function? And whatever that function is, we usually break it down into attention, tangibles, sensations, you know, did it get rid of or get more of any of those things? And sometimes it's one or a combination of them. Sometimes behaviors have their own built-in reinforcement, like scratching a mosquito bite. You know, you, you scratch the mosquito bite and it alleviates a little bit of pain. Uh, so get rid of, and then it also feels kind of good. So in some sense, you get more of a sensation. But for the majority of problem behaviors that we're addressing in children, these behavior problems are socially mediated, meaning that the consequences of those behavior are, are from uh, resulting reinforcers that are delivered by other people. If you feel like, if you're thinking of your own child and you're thinking, okay, well, this behavior problem happens, but it's totally out of the blue or you don't know the function, then it's actually not time for intervention. It's time to look at assessment and figure out what that function is. And how we do that is uh, by a specialized assessment called the functional behavior assessment. And uh, the gold standard in, in some applications and some populations, specifically intellectual disabilities, is something called a functional analysis. And uh, it's, that's about setting up a series of testing control conditions to see when the behavior essentially turns on or turns off. Okay, so that was pretty much the thumbnail view of behavior analysis. I've given you basically the, the aerial view of the science and technology. And on the ground, when I'm working uh, with, with parents, we're really usually just choosing one or two goals. And, and the parents decide that. So whatever would be most meaningful, whether it's teaching a skill or you know, related to mealtime, sleep, toileting, doing things independently. Uh, I've, over the years, I've done things like TTC training, um, learning how to use it independently, those, those kinds of things. And sometimes we're addressing, uh, you know, not just skills, but then problem behaviors, things that are getting in the way of that child participating fully in activities. So whether that's tantrum, self-injury, aggression, those kinds of things. Either way, what we know is that all behavior occurs in some context. And if a behavior is happening at the same rate or more over time, something's reinforcing it. And if there's a behavior that's not happening enough, whether it's your, you're looking at your child's behavior or someone else's, I'm thinking of my partner and taking out the bins to the, uh, to the curb when it's recycling day, that's a behavior that's not happening enough in my household. Well, that's a skill that just hasn't yet been met with enough reinforcement. It's definitely been met with lecturing, um, I'm ashamed to say. Um, and, and so when something's not met with enough reinforcement, we can't get that skill into that child's repertoire yet. So we use these behavior analytic principles to be able to design, oops, design interventions that build on where that child is right now, exactly where they are, build on those strengths and, and go from there. So some behavior programs are long-term or curriculum based. Usually I'm involved for like a few weeks or a few months, but there are some comprehensive programs like an IBI uh, in the autism world, in, in which case, you know, that's, that's meant to be longer, longer term. Um, I do often get asked for off the cuff advice about behavior. The thing is it would actually be irresponsible and potentially dangerous to just give, give advice about that without a proper assessment. Uh, and I know that can feel super unsatisfying, um, but the one general piece of advice that I can give has to do with the most important tool you have, and that is your attention and how you use it. So catch and being good is, uh, is the best advice that I could give. Okay, we're gonna switch gears a little. Uh, most people outside of behavior analysis think that's pretty much all we have to offer the world, you know, token systems, timeouts, um, praise, whether it's disingenuous or not, hopefully it's genuine, but there's so much more to the human experience than just direct contingencies. So to illustrate this, I want to share this koan with you. There's 
uh, three questions. I'm gonna read the question and then you'll see the answer up here on the screen. Are you ready? Okay. Question one, what is the sound of one hand clapping? There you go. Question two, what is the sound of one child misbehaving? And question three, what is the sound of my child misbehaving? Now, I don't know if you know this, but I, I don't have kids of my own. And when I came across this koan, it really spoke to me because it was on the heels of what I like to call the soap incident. Um, I, I'm an overly involved aunt and I've got two nephews and they used to sleep over every Saturday night pre-COVID. Well, competitive hockey was also getting in the way of that. But any which way, it was a classic Saturday night. And I asked the older one who was nine at the time to go take a shower. And after he was done, I went in the, the washroom to get it set up for the, the younger brother. And I happened to look at the soap dish and notice that the soap was bone dry. And my mind could not compute this situation. I pick up the soap, soap and I'm looking at it. And, and I couldn't understand. I call, I call Nikki into the washroom and I'm like, Nikki, you took a shower and you used this soap, right? And he's like, oh yes, Auntie Leslie. And then I was like, but Nikki, the soap is bone dry. And he's, he's marveling at it like it's an X-file. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this guy took a fake shower and he's lying to me. And I lectured him. So, you know, I was like, okay, overcorrection, get back in the shower, you gotta use soap. And I'm thinking I gotta institute some kind of privilege removal. I'm texting my sister, that's, that's his mom. And I'm like, are you aware of any other instances of lying? We gotta get on top of this, we gotta squash this. And what I realized after, long after, is it wasn't so much what happened in the moment that I was reacting to, it was that instantaneous tsunami of worries and fears of imagined futures. What does this actually mean? He lied to me. I'm a behavior analyst and the world's greatest aunt. How could he lie to, to me? I can't have this. And I was thinking, is this an early sign of antisocial personality disorder? Is he gonna wind up in juvenile hall? And it's like our minds go there in an instant. And when I finally came to my senses, I realized, he's a great kid. He lied. People lie. And I don't want to police this child. That's not the kind of aunt I want to be. But this, this really shook me. And, you know, this isn't even my own child. And I thought, you know, I'm, I must be a fraud because I commonly ask parents all the time to manage behavior problems. And here I was set off like a rocket. So that brings us to this problem. And I think it's about when we narrowly focus on fixing something or behavior problems, we can get stuck in this problem solving mode of mind. And we run the risk of seeing kids, other people, even ourselves as collections of problems to be solved. And like in the soap incident, I got completely hooked by my own worries and fears. And it is really difficult to bring your best self and handle a situation when you're time traveling into imagined futures or to the unchangeable past. So this tendency to get into problem solving mode it's part of what we naturally do as humans. It's not bad or wrong and we can do amazing things with it, but at the same time, it's like it's, it's built to create struggle. There's a saying that I love uh, from the acceptance and commitment training or therapy community. And that is, would you want other people to see you as a math problem to be solved or a sunset to be appreciated? And I think the answer is pretty easy. Now, how do you think your child or your partner would want you to see them? So ACT is a, an, a clinical application of a behavior analytic theory of, of language and cognition. And, and what it does is it helps soften the relationships that we have with each other and our relationships with the difficult stuff that we carry inside. And by creating a little bit more space to look at the function of our own behavior when we're stuck in that problem solving mode of mind and notice whether what we're doing is bringing us closer or further away from uh, what's important to us. So in the context of dealing with a child's behavior, acting or adding this act lens can help us notice any struggle that shows up and, and carry it with some compassion and, and kindness just so that you can be present enough to deal with whatever is happening right in front of you, whether it's a 
screaming child or the prospect of living under pandemic restrictions for who knows how long. So uh, the quick recap, behavior is influenced by direct and verbal contingencies. And when there's a mismatch between behavior and the environment, that is the perfect recipe for struggling. And that's when we can use behavior analytic principles to design interventions to get at that mismatch and change behavior. Wow, Leslie, that is so great. Thank you so much for shining a light for all of us. There's so many questions, but I, I really want to talk about ABA first, uh, because you did work with families who had babies born prematurely, and we were able to identify some behavior issues during that time that you're working. What were the main issues that you noticed and how ABA can help uh, those families? Mm -hmm. Uh, so in my experience, what seemed to come up a lot in like the, the toddler age, um, a lot of sleep problems um, and, and specific to the, the preemie community, obviously any medical issues need to be ruled out, breathing uh, concerns before we pursue any kind of behavioral intervention. So as long as we get the green light, we can work with um, uh, pediatricians on designing programs. So, so that was a biggie that came up a lot. Um, meal times, that was another biggie. And then just general uh, compliance, getting, getting kids to do what you want them to do. So I would say not different than, than the typical, typically developing population, general kid behavior concerns. They are the same. There's just uh, in, in the preemie population, um, there are some, some extra considerations that, that we have to look at. Um, before going in there, guns a blazing. But um, yeah, those, those were the biggies. And then come school age, uh, there, there did seem to be a lot more related to more like sticky behaviors or anxious behaviors related to school and, and routine, things like that. Okay, so I really want to share a piece of my story with ABA because it was the first time that I actually heard about ABA it was through your talk in one of the conferences a few years ago. And my son back then had many years of um, issues with feeding. And we had done every single test and we knew there was nothing magically wrong that he couldn't eat. And we did a lot of, a lot of therapies. We did a lot of therapy with speech pathologists to help him to coordinate his movement and his mouth. And when I heard you talking about issues that preemies can have with feeding, especially uh, because there is aversion, because everything that is bad that happens in the mouth and creates in those babies this oh, bad relationship with food and everything that goes into the mouth. And for me, it was like a, a life-changing day. And as you know, uh, I approach you and ask you, please find me, help me to find somebody in the community. And in two sessions, my son started eating food. The first session, he actually ate a broccoli. Well, by that time, he was six years old, only eating pureed foods. Everything has to be pureed in a very specific uh, consistency of the puree. And after that, it was just amazing to see him eating. And today he loves going to restaurants and ordering his own food because it was attached to a behavior. And I feel that like why we don't know about this, why parents don't are not exposed to this um, field, why don't we know about it? And I think this is so important to let parents know this exists and it, it can certainly help some of the, the kids that face some challenges that are related to behavior. And I'm so grateful to you because of that. Because I remember you giving us an example in a conference about a diaper. Can you talk a little bit about diaper? Because I think that's another big issue that the babies face when it's time for toilet training. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and this is actually common, not, not just to, to preemies, um, but the relationship that uh, babies and toddlers develop with their diaper, that is the only place they have ever peed or pooed. So the learning history is tightly in that diaper. And then so when you're trying to take it away, that is weird. And, and now all of a sudden you're saying, sit on this bowl with a hole and, and, and do your business. And you, they, this child has no experience with that and it's so foreign. And so some kids can roll with it, no problem. They'll, you take it away, you make it really exciting and they can just go for it. Other kids, you know, like, like the ones that you, you just can't cajole 
or, or you know, convince them into doing something, they're going to have a little bit more trouble. And so we want to be really uh, respectful and kind and set up a program that's going to uh, help them loosen their relationship with that diaper and develop a, a good relationship with, with the toilet. So yeah, so we're looking at learning histories and, and histories of reinforcement. So my question to you is because obviously a lot of the toddler years, they are a little stubborn, they want to do things on their way or, or the reason that you just explained. So how, when do we know what is you know, expected when is becoming an issue for, for a child? And then when do you need to go and look for help? Yeah, okay, so that's like a million dollar question because there is no like blood test for it. Yes, that's a behavior problem, go get professional help. So it's more about, you know, if you're feeling really stressed out about it, you've already tried the, the usual things, you've gone to your pediatrician, you've, you've Googled it and, and you're not making any headway, you're losing sleep, your kid's losing sleep over it, then, then it's definitely worth uh, talking to somebody about it. Whether, whether it's you're going to go the behavior analysis way or, or another professional, whether it's a, you know, a, a early childhood educator, that, that kind of thing, an occupational therapist. Um, what we're looking at is, uh, at least from a behavior analytic view, is what is developmentally appropriate. And, and sometimes that's what makes it tricky to know, is this a problem or not? Because kids are changing and developing all the time. And so our expectations also have to change over time. And so that, that's what makes it a tough question. But if you're stressed out or losing sleep over it, then um, it, it's worth looking into it. Okay, I think my next question is ages. Does it work for any age group? Because obviously you're focusing more on toddlers, starting school. But let's say your child is 10, 12, and you still have noticed this, some behavior issues. Is it applicable for any age group? Yes. So uh, and I was actually having this conversation the other day with, with somebody when I was talking about, you know, in my current job, because I am working with adults and and also school-aged children, and I, the ABA can be applied across the lifespan, doesn't matter the population, because those behavior principles of reinforcement apply to everybody. So obviously, if, you know, if I was a consultant in a workplace, I'm not going to be creating a, a token economy or, you know, some kind of, for, for workers, it's going to be, it's going to look different, but the principles still apply. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's the wonderful thing about it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens during the applied behavior analysis. So you talk about having an assessment, doing this assessment, and then what is next? Yes, so the assessment piece is collecting information, and, and that's really from the people who know the child or the person the best. So parents, teachers, and getting a sense of you know, their estimation of what's going on. So, and, and really, when we're talking about kids, chances are, the person who's going to be mediating the program is the parent and, and not me. So that is, that is key because that parent is the change maker in that kid's life. I, I can be along for the ride for a little while, but it's really, it's really the parent that's going to, that has the power to make that change. So we collect information about what's going on, decide if whether or not, um, you know, there's, there's goals here that we can carve off and, and other issues are ruled out like medical, other things going on. And then if it's about some problem behavior, then we'll probably be doing a, a functional behavior assessment, figuring out what is the function. Once we figure out the function, then we create interventions that are, it's, it's completely individualized, tied to the function of that behavior for that child. And if it's a skill building program, then we're looking at, okay, what requisite, prerequisite skills does that child have? And we're building from there. So we're creating opportunities for that child to practice that skill under the conditions that we want to see it happen. Okay, so there is no group. So it's pretty much one-on-one, maybe the parents with the child, with your, um, super, let's say, a supervision or the techniques that you, you want the parents to apply with the child. In, in my work experience, it's largely been that way. Although when I'm consulting to a classroom, then I'm working with a teacher where in which case the teacher might be wanting to work, do a program for the whole entire classroom as opposed to one student or a few students. So it really just depends on, on the application, uh, you know, what, how that might look. But the process is the same. We start with assessment, we're looking at function, we're looking at principles of, of reinforcement, 
you know, what skills do we have already on board, and then um, making an intervention that matches function, and then watching over time, collecting data about whether or not it's working. Because if we put something in place and it doesn't change anything, we got to go back to the drawing board. Right. And the lens of intervention varies from child to child, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, and is it available all over Canada? How, how is the, the situation in Canada right now? Because I'm very familiar with Toronto. We know you have your association here. What happens in the rest of the country? So that's a great question. Uh, we're always looking to other provinces. It's the, the profession is not regulated at all across Canada, and, and Ontario seems to be leading the charge on that one. So regulation, professional regulation is coming. In, in, but it is available across Canada. You can find... Um, behavior analysts. If you go to um, the, the BACB website, you can search the registry. So people who have that credential, you can search for them across the world. Um, and in the states, they have some, some states actually have licensure. So they have, um, you know, professionals who, who've had to register for, for a license meet certain criteria. Um, yeah. So, so if a parent way. cannot access ABA because for whatever reason, because I, I know it's a lot of the therapy is not covered by uh, OHIP, you have to pay out of pocket. And if the parents cannot access, can they do anything at home at home to still support their child? If you're going to go to the website that you gave all the links, they read something about it, they, can they do something? Can you give some practical examples of they can possibly do at home to support that child? Yes. So the, the wonderful thing about behavior analysis, and this is probably why I like it so much, is it's a very simple science. It's just a way of looking at behavior. It's not the only way, it, it's one way. And if, it, if you feel like it would be useful, you can learn a little bit and apply it. So um, there, there are parenting groups out there that are based on behavioral principles, things like um, programs like Triple P is, is a phenomenal one. Uh, and, and then and there are some agencies, uh, there's one in the States uh, called Boys Town, and they push out a lot of information for parents, a very behaviorally based uh, free information. They actually have a hotline that's available. Anybody can call the hotline, including Canada in Canada. And uh, so there is a lot of great information out there. Um, there was a book title I had mentioned to you previously that is a little bit more hybrid. You know, it's straight up behavior, but all, mainly act. So taking that lens to um, that's the joy of parenting for um, parents with young young kids that's a great one um, but but yeah there are resources so I'll, you know I'll double check that list and if I if I feel like there aren't enough good resources on there I'll flip you yeah and you can more. add on the comments of the Facebook live because okay. it stays on our page let's let's because our time is almost up but I really want you to talk a little bit more about act and how does that actually work in the practical world because we I mean the concept behind is so great but how does it work in our everyday life yes oh that is a great question so uh act itself is it, it came out of a theory about language and cognition, and a behavioral theory of it. And it's about how we relate to things. So other people, objects, whatever. And, and it's, you know, relationships that we, that we have with these things. And it's almost like the way um, our mind naturally creates struggle with expectations or worries or, you know, what happened in the past that you can't change, what's happening in the future that you're not sure about what's happening, any kind of uncertainty. It's like we're built to struggle. And when it comes to dealing with something that's really important to you, whether it has to do with your child, we're carrying this, you know, unspoken burden about worries that you might have with it. And it's like, okay, we might be working on a toilet training program or a sleep training program. And what's unsaid is all the worries and fears that that parent has about having to do this program. And that's what's getting in the way. And it's act opens up a door to be able to talk about that kind of stuff and look at it with curiosity and not, not in a judgy way, but knowing that that stuff when it's on board can get in the way. And, you know, as, as much as you want to change this, you know, you don't want your child sleeping in your own bed anymore or whatever it might be. And if it was so easy, you would have done it already, but there's things when that kid is crying or you feel like you're doing the wrong thing or bad thing, that's what's getting in the way. So it's almost like, let's address some of that stuff too, as we do 
our behavior program. So um, it's more about like the junk that comes along, uh, you know, on the ride with us and, and, and treating it in, you know, with some honor and respect, as opposed to, I'm just going to power through this. I don't care. You know, I'll deal with that later. Those kinds of things. Um, yeah. That's but it also talks about a, a lot about self-compassion, which I think is such a, a different thing from other kind of therapies, right? Because you, you, it does talk about self-compassion. So tell us a little bit about that. So speaking from my own personal experience with it, and I mean, it has changed how I operate professionally and, and personally. I used to always think, you know, as a behavior analyst, I've, this is my career that I've established. And I thought, I'm only as good as my last case, whatever happened. And it's like, if something didn't go well, that would weigh so heavily on my soul. And it's like, and that's a hard way to work. And it's like, yes, I always want to hit home runs for families. And I love high fiving parents and stuff. But to carry that burden actually gets in the way of doing the important work. And so, you know, the ACT stance helped me personally find a better way professionally to show up to the, the work that we have to do. That's great, Leslie. Uh, we could talk about this for such a long time, but our time is over right now. But I would love to bring you back to talk more about it because I think it's such an important uh, piece of education for families to explore options. There are options out there if you are struggling with our, you know, your child behavior or your own feelings and emotions, especially after dealing with the NICU and the guilt that we carry uh, after the NICU and anxiety. I think there's a lot of tools out there that that's the idea of us bringing Leslie here today uh, to really shine a light what is possible and what is available. So Leslie, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you so much for having me, Fabiana. Thank you. And Take for care. all of you watching us, thank you so much for joining us here. I'll be back next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. All Facebook Lives have been recorded and available on our website, canadianpremise.org. And also a reminder, on, uh, from October 26th to the 30th, I'll be hosting a series of live events uh, focusing exclusively on premature lungs, COVID-19, RSV, and all you need to know to get ready for the winter uh, season that is certainly coming. So thank you. Uh, the registration is already open and it's free on the website. So thank you all so much for joining us here today. Have a good weekend.